everyone. How are you doing? Everybody doing well? Odinson, you doing well over there online? Throw it in there. We are so glad all of you are here. And I'm not really sure. I guess you still say Happy Thanksgiving today. I'm not really sure how that part works. But if you have stepped out of your turkey-induced stupor in the last couple of days, like I have, you're probably feeling at some level like Thanksgiving is a distant memory at this point because Black Friday just swallows the gratitude season in one bite, <laughs> right? And it ushers us into the next season, and that season starts with a C. Everybody say it with me. We are now into the consumerism season. You got it. Nice, you guys. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> If you're like me, you're looking at your schedule over the next month, and the only thing that comes to mind, I guess, is like, buckle up, Buttercup, because it's about to get wild, the amount of sheer volume of things on the calendar. I'm just at, like, do you feel that pressure every year, right, when we get to this time? Is your gift list getting longer? Are you jotting, like, to-dos on every piece of paper you get your hands on this time of year? We aren't even in December yet. <laughs> I already still feel like I'm getting stressed out. In fact, I feel like I have a subconscious stress response to the word December at some level. And that kind of makes me mad, right? I'm like, what is going on with this? Is this how I'm supposed to feel? Am I supposed to usher in the Prince of Peace with this much chaos in my life? Right? Like, I get annoyed with this. In the series that we're starting now and over the next couple of weeks, we're talking about how God orchestrates all things, everything, not just our lives, all of world history. He is orchestrating to come together for the good of those who love him, down to the very specific details of when and where Jesus was born, okay, the whole thing. But my daily life doesn't always feel very orchestrated by God, especially this time of year. And the conclusion that I'm coming to at some level is just this. This might seem harsh, but I think we are doing Christmas wrong. I mean, we've got to be doing it wrong at some level, right? All of this collective feeling of insanity, something has to be wrong. But there's a practice that I think, I mean, that we're going to be talking about today, that I think might just bring Christmas from frantic consumerism to peaceful preparation. It might just save Christmas. What could be that powerful what could rescue Christmas from the grip of the hustle? Well, it's a ritual that is ancient and not at all original <laughs> called Advent. I believe Advent can save Christmas. But here's the deal. Some of you just rolled your eyes. You're like, oh, wow, Advent. Breaking some new ground there, Copernicus. Nice one, guy. Right? It's real new, real original. Not, right? I mean, maybe you grew up being dragged through Advent, and so like you're having a flashback right now. It's not pretty. You're saying, I have spent my adult life trying to get away from all of those meaningless rituals. Don't drag that nonsense back into my life, right? I mean, that's how some of you feel. And I get that, okay? I get it. But I just want to challenge the assumption here for a little bit that a ritual or a tradition has to be formal and meaningless, it is true that these kind of rituals can be foolish, meaningless. They can even be dangerous, depending on what's going on. But that doesn't mean that they have to be. And again, I think whatever church tradition you grew up in or didn't makes a massive difference in how you respond to this idea. Um, but if you think about it for a second, I, they don't have to be dangerous or meaningless. And I think that's true because the Bible commands us to do any number of things, all of which can become monotonous if they aren't taken seriously. For instance, communion, or baptism, or reading the Bible, or gathering together as a church. Right? Any of those deeply important and meaningfully commanded rituals in the Christian life can become meaningless. So I think I'd say it this way, that anything done repeatedly, but not intentionally, will soon be done meaninglessly. Okay, anything that you do repeatedly but not intentionally will be done meaninglessly. And it's okay for things like brushing your teeth to become meaningless, as long as it's a ritual, which I hope it is. Um, but the difference in this context is that communion, the only difference between communion being meaningful or not meaningful after you've done it a thousand times, is the posture of your heart. Right? It's, not, it's not the ritual itself. Rituals can be bad, but also the Bible is full of them. They can be very powerful when they're done intentionally. 
Um, I'll, I'll admit, in all of this conversation, when it comes to rituals or traditions, a younger version of me would have kind of turned up my nose at this whole conversation. I didn't grow up in a church tradition that did a lot of liturgy, kind of high church liturgy. And so I probably took a little bit of pride in the fact that, like, we weren't the weird incense people, okay? I was kind of stoked about that, if I'm being honest. Um, I'm better now, okay? <laughs> no, but in the last few years, some things have changed, right? Namely, that I had kids. And when I had kids, I suddenly realized it's my responsibility to pass faith on to them, and I'm feeling ill-equipped to do that. So the idea that there would be times built into the year where we're automatically supposed to talk about important things, that suddenly is like, wow, that's amazing. That takes some of the pressure off. I'm really excited about that idea. And so in that spirit, as I've been learning to embrace some of these more liturgical practices or rituals, I want to spend our time together trying to prove to you this is kind of my thesis, all right? That rituals, specifically Advent, have any of these rituals, they have a biblical precedent, they also have a history in the church, and they have practical value. Okay, I'm, I'm going to spend our time saying it has a biblical precedent, history in the church, and practical value. So, if that feels a little bit like a lecture, because it kind of is, all right? <laughs> Sorry about that. We're going to go deep into some things here this morning, hopefully, that I, I'm hoping can land in a way that will be very practical and helpful for us. So let's start off with a definition, okay? When I'm saying ritual or rite or tradition or liturgy, all, I'm kind of using all those terms interchangeably. And I want to define a ritual this way. This comes from Noelle Piper. She's an author who wrote a book called Treasuring Christ in Our Traditions, which I thought was very helpful. And she said it this way. Tradition is the handing down of information, beliefs, and worldview. It's the handing down of those things from one generation to another by word of mouth and the regular repetition of example, ceremony, and celebration. Okay, that's how she defines a tradition. And I like that because that describes it as a mechanism. It's just a mechanism that we add to our lives to reinforce truth to not only ourselves, but to the people that are under our care. And I want to just talk about one objection. You might be feeling like, oh, hey, I'm single, or I don't have kids. Like, does this still apply to me? Noelle, again, had a good quote about that that I think kind of encapsulates my, my thoughts. She said, if you're single, traditions may be even more important for you. Your traditions, they may involve peers who are friends, other adults you want to minister to, and the children in your life, like neighbors, students, and friends' children. But the traditions you develop and practice will draw others into being your family circle. I tend to agree with that. I think that these practices or rituals are for anyone who follow Jesus and who want to remember truth at strategic times each year. Okay, so that's the definition we're going to be working off. Let's turn to the biblical precedent, okay? Rituals, I believe, they have a biblical precedent. What is it? Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Exodus chapter 12. We're going to look around in Exodus 12 for a little bit, which is in a very critical moment in the biblical story. So I'd love to catch you up as to what has been going on in the Bible to this point. The people of Israel, God's people, they are currently at this moment in Exodus 12, they are slaves in Egypt. They have a leader who's trying to free them. His name is Moses. And um, we, he's trying to lead these people out of Egypt. So what he has to do is he has to go to the Pharaoh, who is the most powerful man in the known world at the time, and he has to go to him and say, hey, let my people go. Unsurprisingly, the leader of the known world says, no. <laughs> Why? <laughs> no. So God brings a series of nine plagues that would have been both religiously and economically devastating onto the people of Egypt. He brings these plagues. Moses keeps going to Pharaoh. He says, let my people go. Mos and Pharaoh keeps saying, no. So God brings one last plague. He says he's going to bring it. It's not going to affect their wallet. It's going to affect their heart. And the plague is going to be that the firstborn son of every family in both Egypt and Israel will die. Unless there's a way to avoid this plague. And th that way to avoid it is to kill a lamb, take its blood, and spread it over your doors. That's step one. I recognize that that sounds extremely strange. We could talk about the cultural differences some other time. But that's step one, spread the blood of a lamb over the doorpost. And then the next step is to prepare a meal. And this meal, for the people of Israel, God is saying, this is basically like a to-go meal that you're going to get and put it in the car and eat it on your way out of Egypt because after this plague, y'all are headed out. Okay? So he says, kill the lamb, spread the blood, prep the meal. That is the instructions that he gives them. 
in order to avoid this plague. He's giving them the instructions to avoid the plague, and the plague has not happened yet. That's very important. God is still in this pre-plague moment establishing this practice as something bigger than this moment. He's saying this will become a ritual that extends. Check it out, Exodus 12, verse 14. He says, this day shall be for you a memorial day. This is what's about to happen. He's predicting the future. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as feast. Same idea, a few verses later. Verse 17. He says, and you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. That's what he's going to call this moment for them. For on this very day, I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. Okay, you're capturing. He's very emphatic about the long-term nature of this practice. It's not a one-time thing. This is not a plague avoidance system. This is instead a meaningful long-term ritual to remember what God was about to do for them. This becomes their 4th of July. God is saying, put down a marker, never forget this day. And I love this. <laughs> this is wild to me. God actually gives them like a press release statement as to how they should talk about this ritual in the years to come when they get questions about it. Okay? It, later in this chapter, he says, Down the road, you shall observe this rite as a statute for you and your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, in other words, down the road, you're released, you're in freedom, as he has promised, you shall keep the service. Keep doing it. When your children say to you, Hey, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, here's the press release, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people in Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but he spared our houses. From the very first moment this ritual was established, God knew that someday there would come a group of people who were not around for the whole plague thing. And so they're going to be super confused. They're like, what's with the weird lamb killing? Why do we make this meal? It doesn't even taste that good. There's going to be a teenager who's like, Dad, seriously, why are we doing this? And in that moment, God knew there's going to come a group of people who did not personally experience this redemption. And so he's saying, when that happens, be prepared to explain the original context. Show them, even though this doesn't matter to them, that it should Explain why it matters. And this ritual meal, here's what's amazing. The Jewish people are still doing this every year to this day. They literally play out that conversation from Exodus that we just read. They, they role play it every year as a teaching tool for the generational preservation of their faith. God required rituals of his people so that they would remember. You could say it this way. When it comes to the biblical precedent for a ritual, rituals regularly rehearse to remind. Rituals regularly rehearse to remind. I'm only going to say that twice, because otherwise I'll mess it up. It's very difficult to say. Um, But they're meant to keep things on our mind. Passover, here's the thing, it was the first of the rituals, but it was not the last. We already read a passage of Scripture this morning where they set up 12 stones after they had crossed over the Jordan. And they said, hey, someday your children will ask you, what's with those 12 stones? And you're going to tell them, we crossed over the Jordan just like we crossed over the Red Sea. It's meant to be a conversation starter. And you can read Deuteronomy 16, which I would encourage you to do this week. You'll see that Passover ended up being one of three annual festivals for the people of Israel. And they had to celebrate all three of these every year. And they were not allowed to celebrate them in their hometown. They had to come, all of them, as an entire nation, to Jerusalem three times a year for a full week to go through the exact same rituals every year. Because God was shaping a nation. And he knew that these practices were going to form their thinking. Could they have become meaningless repetition? Of course. In fact, they did. But that's not the fault of God or his festivals. It's the fault of his people who forgot their purpose. Because here's the thing. At this time and up through the time of Jesus, the nation of Israel was a people. God had called them out, made them his own. He had, they had been redeemed. They had been redeemed from the nation of Egypt and brought as free people into, into the land of Israel. But even though that was true, they were experiencing the brokenness of the world. Whether it was the 
Assyrian oppression or the Babylonian oppression or the Roman oppression or their own internal fighting. They experienced brokenness. And so, despite the fact that they had been redeemed, they were still eagerly awaiting the completion of their redemption. They were a people awaiting the Messiah. There was an already, not yet, are we there yet tension that existed in their life. They were in the middle of two salvations, clinging to the memory of what God had already done, anticipating the salvation he had promised to bring. And these rituals were part of God's plan for preserving the nation of Israel from generation to generation. He full well knew they will be pressed in by foreign powers, by internal fighting, by apathy in their own hearts. And so he commanded three separate week-long annual festivals to force the people to remember their salvation. I mean, the law, if you were to read it through carefully, you will see it is absolutely full of counterintuitive practices that are terrible for productivity, especially in an agrarian society. I mean, the Sabbath is a great example of this. That's terrible for productivity. But it was meant to push back against the empires around them and the evil that was lurking inside of them. What does all that have to do with us? All of that biblical precedent. Well, I'm convinced that we are faced with a similar set of cultural pressures. And maybe, just maybe, God was onto something when he commanded annual rituals that would reorient his people. Perhaps, if we're trying to rescue Christmas from hustle and stress, we could use a ritual that will center us back on what matters most. I guess what I'm saying is that I believe Advent can be an antidote to the Christless American Christmas. Antidote to the Christless American Christmas. Now, okay, hear me out. I am not saying that this is a biblical command required for all Christians that they practice Advent in this specific way. All I'm saying is that if you're like me and you tend to forget what matters, like the people of Israel, maybe God's prescription of an annual review in the form of a ritual could help keep the big picture in view. Just maybe. Advent could be an antidote to the Christless American Christmas. So, okay, Advent has a biblical precedent, the idea of a ritual. Let's turn now to the history of Advent in the church. Okay, let's see what we can learn from what Christians have done in the past. What's the history of Advent? Um, At the risk of being initially uh, overly... Uh, basic. Let's at least talk about the meaning of the word Advent, because maybe that's something that's been in the back of the room. What, is, what does the word Advent mean? Well, the word simply means coming or arrival. Advent comes from a Latin and a Greek word, which mean coming or arrival. So whenever we're talking about Advent, that's what's going on. That's the meaning of the word. What are the origins of Advent as a practice? Where did it come from? In other words, when did they invent Advent? Okay, I liked it. I liked it. That's why I said it. Okay. Um, the origins of the Advent celebration, I'll admit, they're kind of hard to track down, okay? There's a lot of history going on here. And if you don't like history, this kind of stuff bores you. Here's your permission slip, my gift to you. Pull out your phone. This would be a great opportunity. Check Instagram, maybe tweet about how good that joke was that I just told. Whatever you want. I'm not telling you what you have to do. But if you'd like to zone out, I'll tell you when to come back, okay? For you history nerds, let's jump into this. Here we go. Origin of Advent. Without going too far into the weeds, I'll just say this. We take it for granted as modern Christians that that Christmas is on December 25th. But this date itself took a little bit of time to finalize, okay? Obviously, there can't be a church-wide celebration like a pre-party for Christmas until you know when Christmas is, right? So they had to come about a date. Maybe you've never thought about this, though. Christ's death is very easy to date as to when it happened during the year because it happened during Passover. Passover happens at the same time every year, so we know when to celebrate Easter each year. Um, But in the actual text of the Bible, it can give us a sense of when, meaning what year Christ was born because of other events going on. It doesn't tell us when in the calendar year Christ was born. So as people were trying to put together, like, when did this happen? How should we figure it out? Um... Believers had to, at some level, choose. Now, there's a lot of things that go into this, and it's, it's more complicated than I'm going to make it seem. Um, but they had to decide, when should we celebrate Christ's birth? Um, and so they started celebrating it early in, the, in Christian history. They started celebrating it around the time of the winter solstice. 
So late in December each year is when it started being celebrated, the winter solstice being the longest, darkest day of the year, the day that the night lasts the longest. There's a lot of reasons that went into this, one of them probably being that there were other pagan holidays already going on on the winter solstice. So Christians were like, around this time of year, we already got some time off work, they're already having parties, we might as well like co-opt that and use it for our own purposes. So that is one historical factor that might have led to that. But for the majority of Christians, summarizing all the history, December 25th for the majority of Christians in the world today is when Christmas is celebrated. And once Christmas had a date, Christmas can have a pre-party. So around 300 years after the time of Christ, there's evidence of some early Advent rituals happening in what is now modern-day Spain and France. Soon after that, about 80 years later, there's a church council that starts solidifying some of the Advent practices and giving suggestions. And then over the next 200 years, up until about 500 A.D., there's some more solid things happening, more, we start to see sermons being written about Advent, the practice becomes more widespread, and we have even more historical records. So for those of you who are zoned out, come back in, here's the point, what I'm trying to say here, okay? The origins of the practice that we think of as Advent today is around 1,500 years old, okay? 1,500 years old. Why do I mention all this history? Again, if you grew up in a church tradition like me, we don't put a lot of weight on what the church did because there's a lot of times where the church did a lot of things we're not real proud of. Okay, so what they did isn't always very relevant. But I just bring up the historical practice of the church to make the point that it's a practice, in this case, rooted in hundreds and hundreds of years of Christians who were doing their best to orient their entire life around Christ. And so I would say there's at least some wisdom in noticing what other believers have done before us to make Christ the center of their lives, right? I'd say it this way, that church history, it's, it's a tool, it's not a master. It's a tool, it's, not, it's useful, but it doesn't tell us what we must do. We don't have to do what they've always done. But if they did something consistently for 1,500 years in a row, maybe we could consider the wisdom of keeping it going. So when it comes to Advent and its history, we now know um, a little bit about its meaning, a little bit about its origin. Let's talk next about the symbolism, the symbolism of Advent. And I got to say, I, I'm not an expert <laughs> on any of this stuff, especially different traditions and, and strains of the church put different symbolism on different things. But there are two pieces of, as, as I've explored this lately in particular, of symbolism, two pieces that mean a lot to me. The first one is the meaning of light, the symbolism behind light this time of year. As I mentioned, Christ's birth began to be associated with the winter solstice. And I think there's a cool meaning embedded in the idea that Christ was born on the darkest day of the year. If you think about it, in the days leading up to the winter solstice, you're being led each day increasingly into darkness. We're experiencing this, right? The days get shorter and shorter. The darkness itself is reaching further and further into the daytime, increasing the overall territory of darkness. But then, in one day, the tide turns. Ever so slightly, the day after the winter solstice, there's just a bit less darkness. And then there's a march of barely noticeable but steady progress of light slowly invading the darkness. And that progression of daylight continues until the summer solstice, the longest day of the year. So think about that as connected to the birth of Christ. The, the practice of Advent, the ritual, is leading you deeper and deeper into darkness. And then the light comes. But it doesn't come with some eruption of light. It doesn't come bombastically in some overpowering way. The light dawns slowly. It dawns humbly. But over time, if you're watching carefully, the power of the light of Christ begins to take over the darkness. And even though the light doesn't usually come the way we want it to, light inevitably comes and we get to watch it gradually take over the darkness. I think that's an amazing picture of Christ coming. Christ is the light of the world. But he's born as a baby. And for three decades, he's going to do basically nothing. And then his mission is going to take thousands of years to be completed. 
The light, however, is coming. It will not be stopped. Darkness seems like it's winning, but the light will overcome. And that's why at Advent, we light one candle a week. The gradual dawning of the light. Because look, if I had been around when they were establishing this ritual, I would have been like, Jesus is the light of the world. Let's just throw on a switch, put on a massive light. Hey, everyone, Jesus is the light of the world, and he's come. Jesus is here. But that's not what we do. We light one candle a week. And slowly but surely, the light overcomes the darkness. Isaiah says it this way. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. For to us, a child is born, and to us, a son is given. The light has come, and Jesus is the light of the world. So that's the symbolism of the light. But I think there's another aspect of symbolism I want to talk about, and that's the double meaning of the word Advent, the double meaning. Advent, like we said, it means coming or arrival, but in the New Testament, the word for coming or arrival is actually never used in connection to Christ's first coming at his birth. It is only exclusively used about Christ's second coming in the future. So historically, the practice of Advent has worked that for the first two weeks, starting right now, that there actually wasn't an emphasis on Christ's birth, but a focused attention on anticipating Christ's second coming. It wasn't until the last two weeks where you began to look toward Christ's birth. I think that's a really profound idea that has some implications that we're going to talk about in just a moment for how our practice should inform our daily use of Advent. So, so, so far we've seen rituals have a biblical precedent, they have a history in the church, but then finally I believe they also have practical value. Advent has practical value. Adopting this practice can change our mindset. But we can't have it change our mindset until we know how to do it, okay? So let me just take a brief second and give you an overview of how to Advent, okay? Here is how to Advent. At the end of the day, what I would say is if you have a tradition as a family that focuses you each day and causes you to daily reflect on Christ's first and second coming, then I would say stick with it. Just keep doing it. I'm not here to suggest what's best. In fact, what I'm going to suggest isn't even really that profound. How to Advent, you just simply get a tool and use it every day. <laughs> That's it. Just get a tool and use it every day. This is Advent 101. I'm not asking you to go to like pro-level Advent right now. I'm not asking you to light specific candles and read certain scriptures on certain days and like all this stuff. Because I, I'm not, I don't want to do that because I don't want it to get too formulaic. That's part of the problem of why people struggle with this stuff is they feel like it's all prescribed for them. And if you grew up like me and you're not used to being told how you must, you can feel a little bit like, oh, I don't, I don't know that I like it. That's fine. Just get a tool and use it every day. What tool could I use to focus my heart on Christ's coming? Some of you are like, great, I'm in. That sounds good. Here's a problem. Advent starts today. I didn't think about this, and I don't have any time to think about this, so I guess I'll just have to wait till next year. Nah, fam, we got you, okay? We got you. Because on your way out today, you should go and receive an Advent bag. Inside of this Advent bag, you will find all the things that you need to celebrate Advent. For instance, a list of scriptures that you can read and questions that you could reflect on in that sense. There's also inside of here, candles. Goodness gracious, they even gave you matches, okay? <laughs> Everything you could need to celebrate Advent inside of this bag. Here's a great tool. Or, if you're one of the people that registered for the kids' Advent boxes, I lug that massive thing home. I can't wait to open that up with my kids. There's so many age-appropriate things every day for all of Advent to help them remember Christ's coming. We're going to be flooding social media with posts and things that you could... You used to remember, I mean, any, we would love to resource you. You have no excuse to not engage in Advent this year. Let us take care of the logistics. We'd love to make that possible. Get a tool. Use it every day. Your responsibility, once you get this tool, is just to actually use it. So that's how to Advent. But let me explain just very simply how I think Advent can help. I think that there are four ways that Advent challenges our cultural tendencies, and I think in doing that, it actually can help us save Christmas. Because look, here's the deal. We are not unique. We are not unique. Sure, our time period has some uniquenesses to it, but we have the same basic issues that God's people have always had. <laughs> We're just like Israel. 
We need to look back on our salvation and look forward to Christ's second coming. This is what we said about Israel before. These same four things are true of us as well. That as the church, we are a people. God has redeemed us, called us his own. We have been redeemed. We can look back on what Christ accomplished on the cross. Look back to his finished work at Calvary and his resurrection. But we are also today experiencing the brokenness of this world. I don't even have to illustrate that. You're experiencing the brokenness of the world. And so in the meantime, we are eagerly awaiting the completion of our salvation, saying, Lord Jesus, come. Right? We're living in the same place, in the middle of two salvations. And we have to have rhythms that will keep us focused on truths that are going to keep us grounded. Because our world is constantly trying to shape our outlook. We're constantly under pressure to think like the world around us. But as we stand by practices like Advent, we are proving to ourselves and to a watching world that we were not made for this life. There's something bigger going on in our community. Advent is pressing us as a practice into a new mold. One that is very, very countercultural. Here's what I mean. Here's the four things. I think, look, we're too rushed. Advent presses us into a new mold by making us slow down. Rushed is in the air that we breathe. (laughs) We can't imagine a world without hustle. Rituals force us to pause. I mean, if you're going to be consistent every day between now and Christmas to do any kind of a ritual, even just opening up the little box and eating some chocolate, it's going to take some intentionality, right? You're going to have to slow down. We're going to have to think deeply. We're going to need space. And imagine how different that is from the world around us right now, where everyone's just rushing to buy a new gift and screaming at the Amazon delivery person for all the supply chain issues, right? How different is this practice? We're choosing a different path. It causes us to slow down. We're also (laughs) impatient, and Advent makes us wait. Everything in our life is fast. It's immediate. I used to love two-day shipping. Now I'm annoyed if it isn't same-day delivery, right? (laughs) And you're just like that. Some of you started listening to Christmas music two months ago, so don't laugh at me, okay? Look, we are all impatient. We hate waiting, and Christmas is no exception. But the point of a ritual is to build anticipation. We hold back. It slows us down. Instead of plunging headlong into Christmas cheer, we build anticipation, We join with those who waited hundreds of years for the Messiah, who eagerly anticipated his coming. And we stand shoulder to shoulder with all the believers who are still saying, Come, Maranatha, Lord. We learn to wait as we celebrate Christ's arrival by showing restraint in the way we celebrate his arrival. Thirdly, we are too cozy. We are too cozy, and Advent makes us expectant. We <laughs> are incredibly comfortable. Even when we're not comfortable, we're more comfortable than more humans than humans have been in all of human history. But when you're comfy, we tend to get cozy. But Advent keeps us looking forward, because this earth is not our home. We are still awaiting the return of our King. And so this season is not just about what God has done, but what he will do. His work is not yet finished. But if we as believers are content with a cup of hot chocolate and another Christmas movie, we're missing out on the big picture. Advent keeps us hungry for what has not yet come. We can't just be content with the lights and the music and the happy feelings of this cozy season. But then finally, I'd say we are a product of our time, and Advent connects us to something bigger. This reality is not unique to us. Everyone's shaped by their culture, their worldview, their experiences. But joining into an ancient tradition roots us in something bigger, something older than us. I I love this quote again from Noelle. She said, our children and grandchildren don't have to be locked into the small world of their own experience with God. What a picture. Traditions or rituals give them a whole world's worth and a whole history's worth of God. What this does, it prevents us from being formed by what our culture says about Christmas instead of what the scriptures say. 
It helps us avoid the same problem that Israel had of being shaped by their culture and ultimately abandoning their God. We tell the old, old story again to remember what we dare not forget. Advent makes us slow down, makes us wait, makes us expectant, and it connects us to something bigger. And, and I guess I'd just say for me, um, personally, that last one I think is what's most meaningful to me right now. I know, man, having a, a time when church was different because of COVID and gatherings were, di- you know, we weren't even here yet for the, for the worst of that, but there's so many things as even as a pastor where you're not, you don't have Sunday gatherings. That makes you think about like what are we doing and what are we up to and how are we ministering and how do we still engage with people and what does the mission of the cross and the gospel look like in this context in a world where we can't do what we've always done seemingly. It can make you ask all kinds of questions about the model and the approach and our cultural moment. And one of the things that it, it left me doing sometimes was honestly feeling a little bit disconnected. Like are are we doing it right? Whatever that even means. Like, is this thing, this local expression of church, the way it ought to be done? So what this has actually sent me doing is looking for something a little bit bigger than just one local church, as beautiful as the family of the Bay Area is. Something that connects me to something beyond this time and place, but something bigger in church history. And, and that's why this practice at the moment is really, it, it means something special to me because of what the season we've been walking through. Something personal that <laughs> helps me see that it's not, it's not just my life, it's not just this church, it's not just this country, not just this era. God has been at work in his coming and his future arrival for, for thousands of years. It's so much bigger. So I'd ask, will you join me, so many other families at Bay Area, and millions of Christians over thousands of years in celebrating and saving Christmas? We save it by personally rehearsing what matters to us afresh this year. Let me be the first person to tell you, Merry Christmas. But also let me remind you with great joy, family, that Jesus is coming again. Yeah. So Lord, we thank you for your coming for your willingness to put on a body, to die for us, to come back to life, all of those things. But also for in your wisdom delaying your second coming, the completion of your kingdom, so that we could be part of it. Thank you for that invitation, but help us to eagerly await your coming, knowing that you came for us, you will come again, and yet you are with us in the meantime. In Jesus' name.